Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Advances in Hydrogen Deuterium Exchange Mass Spectrometry that Can Improve Studies of Biosimilars and Membrane Protein Drug Targets. It is presented by Jeffrey Hudgens, PhD, a research chemist and IBBR fellow at the Institute for Bioscience and Biotechnology Research in the Bioprocess Measurements Group of the Biomolecular Measurement Division at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want anytime you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hudgens. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Well, thank you for listening to my webinar. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about developments in the field of, of um, hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry uh, as it applies to biosimilars. <clears throat> you may wonder why the National Institutes of Standard Technology, which I work with, is interested in this problem. And just to tell you a little bit about the agency, it's a non-regulatory agency within the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, we don't make any rules. We do um, make some consensus standards with industry to help accelerate industry. And this is responsible for the physical standards of the U.S. and test methods and calibrations. We have a unique mission, which is to promote innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurement science standards and technology. And in particular, with respect to biomanufacturing, its mission is to develop measurement science standards, reference data, and tools that support the development, manufacturing, and regulatory approval of biologic medicines. <clears throat> and this is uh, quite in line with the talk today. The method I'm going to be talking about is hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry, HDXMS. Um, it's been a method that's actually been around since about 1991. Uh, and has grown rapidly in its, uh, in its popularity. Um, as of about a year ago, there were 1,860 refereed papers. These are the original papers. They don't include reviews or anything. And the topics of these papers have spanned quite a number of things, but about 7% of them are about biopharmaceuticals. I suspect there's a dark literature within companies that is much larger. There's membrane proteins, interactions, epitope maps, um, protein ligand work, and structural characterization. Everything that a, that a structural biologist and biochemist would want to know about, um, about things. So um, excuse me. Um, so move. That's the, um, the method has become a, a regular tool in structural biology and, and biochemistry labs <clears throat> with its visible uses in biopharma of starting around 2008, uh, there was some effort to use HDX for uh, data for evaluating biosimilarity between uh, two lots of drugs or a lot of, of, of the um, an innovator drug with a, um, with a candidate biosimilar. Um, there's been a little bit of work on that since. <clears throat> in an internal memo at FDA, uh, they noted in 2016 that 15% of all drug 
applications contain HDXMS data. And just a year later, I did a search and found that there's about 110 patents um, of biosim mostly involving biosimilars or biologics um, that are that use HDX data in them uh, as part of their part of their mechanism of action and that sort of and uh, th those sorts of things. Uh, in 2017, I learned that there's two companies that are using HDXMS for quality control work. I'm not going to be talking about that, but it is a little bit different from what I'm doing here today, but not much. The key of, of, of uh, hydrogen deuterium exchange is that there are certain um, uh, am the amide sites of of a um, along a protein polymer are all uh, exchange at the in a magic rate, which is around a half-life of 10 seconds to 60 days. And with hydrogen to term exchange mass spectrometry, we can measure that. Covalent bonds uh, just simply don't exchange and the side chains on some, on some um, uh, amino acids just exchange at the millisecond rate. So they're simply too fast and they don't seem to have much um, of relevance to um, to to um, biopharma anyway. <clears throat> the um, theory theory of how this works, um, how the exchange occurs, is that most of the time a protein is in site is in its closed form. It doesn't interact with solution. It will not exchange. And then at certain times a um, a um, a perturbation occurs and it opens, a site opens for exchange. This is the amide site that is. And when it's open, the you have the, uh, the amino acid acts simply as an acid and base. And so it, it undergoes the exchange rate that is determined by the acid base. So, <clears throat> um, and what that, so what this means in total is that the protein dynamics of the closing and opening process is modulated by the higher order structure of the of the protein uh, polymer, and the exchange rate is just simply an acid base property. But because it modulates it, we can we can um, um, study um, and do some interesting things with with the method. Now, looking at uh, uh, I mentioned this has to do with higher order structure. And if you take, for example, an alpha helix and it's um, and it's in its normal or completely rested lowest energy form, and you try and balance a, a solvent molecule off of it, it um, this probably won't display properly, but the result is there's no reaction. There's no exchange because the the uh, the the amino the the amides are involved in complexation with oxygen and the energy to remove that there's just simply not enough gives energy to remove it but if the for example the alpha helix is stressed and exchange and extended and this occurs in normal normal fluctuations of the protein over time it weakens the hydrogen bond to the oxygen and you can end up with if now when solvent bounces off of it an exchange can occur. This modulation is acid or base catalyzed, and it occurs mainly in the absence of strong hydrogen bonding, such as when an alpha helix is stressed and opens it up for exchange. The electrostatic and hydrophobic interactions also expect, uh, affect exchange rates because they stabilize, they can stabilize the protein also further against exchange. Now I mentioned that there are there are actually two types of cal of catalysts, but there's actually three. There's but there's base catalyzed, which occurs at pHs above three are dominated by pHs above three, and acid catalyzed, which are dominated at pH less than three. There is also a slow water catalyzed event, um, which is usually not terribly important, but there is a minimum at which the rate of the exchange is 
is, is neither ca acid or base catalyzed. And that occurs for each amino acid somewhere in the, in the two and a half to four uh, pH range. So this becomes important for our method to, that I'm going to present. So here's the steps of a hydrogen deuterium exchange ex experiment. <clears throat> you can have two types of solution. You can do this separately. You can have your protein without any complexation, or you can have it with a solution containing the protein and a ligand. So that's your APO is your, is your protein alone, and your HOLO is your protein plus ligand. And of course, they will bind. So <clears throat> you can take the, um, you, you, you take the protein, and A here, you first dunk it into or immerse it into D2O, and that, pro that begins a labeling process. And the amide hydrogens exchange at their particular rate with, with deuterium in the water. At a given time, you take that solution and you immerse it into a, an acidic um, uh, quenching solution, pH 2.5, and you have a denaturant which unwinds your protein. And then you inject that into a, pro pro a pro proteolytic column, which contains pepsin usually. They can have other prote proteases also, but usually pepsin is the most common. And this slices up your protein into peptides. The peptides then go through a, 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 a liquid chromatography step where they separate, and each one of the peptides comes out at a given time. <clears throat> now, given a, um, as shown in the, in the, in the, uh, oops, in the uh, slide below, we do this for several, at several different immersion times of zero to, say, 24 hours. <clears throat> And uh, this is four hours here. And each experiment is, me is measured. And you integrate the, the, uh, cent to find the centroid mass. <clears throat> and I'll talk about this in a second. And then you plot this out. You plot this out on a, on a graph versus time. And you will see a difference in APO and HOLO, um, in APO and HOLO in the areas where there is contact in the protein occurring. Now, one thing you have to keep in mind in all of this is that there is a back exchange process. As soon as you quench, you're beginning to do your analysis in water, and the, and the great dominance of water in the solution causes deuterium to be swapped out for hydrogen again. And so the labeling that you put onto the protein begins to, begins to fade. So... Um, I'll talk more about this problem later because we have a bit of a solution for it. So to focus a little bit more in, as each peptide immerse comes out of the chromatography system at a particular time, it will present a mass envelope. And uh, the under-deuterated one will be the lightest mass. And as you see here in the sequence of, of, um, of ion fragment spe spectra, you can see that the center of mass moves to heavier and heavier mass with time. This is the deuterium uh, becoming onto the amide site of the of the protein on, in this particular peps, peptide, and you can plot this again. Um, so, what does an experiment the, the lab look like? The lab looks like has it has a, a process robot. It has your chromatography system. It has your. Uh, it has a, a, a reasonably high resolution um, mass spectrometer. Now we use an Orbitrap. Actually, most laboratories use a time of flight instrument. It, they're all they're all good, so um, they're all adequate for this measurement. Um, Twenty years ago, that might not have been true. Today, it's very hard to find an instrument that isn't capable of of. Of, of, uh, of, of giving you the data you need. Now, what does a, what, what is a typical experiment or one experiment look like? Um, this is taken from a uh, piece of work that was on looking at meningitis. Um, and they, were they had developed an antibody 
that that bound with factor H, which decorates body, the uh, cells in your body and protects us from the innate immune, immune system. Um, and so they were looking for the, the shown here in the middle here is the um, is the um, the CDR loops of the of the um, um, of the of the antibody, and shown here are the sections of peptide which are showing interaction with the factor H. The factor H is the ligand in this case, so that's the holo. And you can see that there is a that that the holo has less deuterium uptake in the peptide range of 126 to 137, and likewise in the other subpanels, you can see that in each case, these the uh, the, pep, the uh, peptide say 214 to 233 shows suppressed deuterium uptake in the complex form, and this allow and this allows you to map out which loops of the CDR are actually interacting with the ligand. Looking at the um, looking at this, um, this study done very nice study done by Melito um, a few years ago. Uh, they actually used uh, several different ways and came up with a consensus a consensus map of the binding sites on factor H. Now, what's shown here in the in the pan, in the center is the in red is the consensus binding sites that they found, and this is from all methods. Um, and the and what's shown is only the uh, the fifth and sixth domain of the of the factor H protein, but which is where the meningitis attacks. Um, they use phage array, which is shown on the left here, um, and peptide array. And they used an X-ray structure, which of course found the strong interaction. And, but then they found they used HDX. The interesting thing about this is that this the red here is the is the consensus binding is somewhere between 800 to 1,000 square angstroms, and the hydrogen deuterium exchange experiment captures that. The X-ray structure captures the strongest interactions, but the hydrogen deuterium exchange actually captures the majority of it. So anyway, that that's this this sort of experiment which looks at at, a, at, um, at ligand binding, it comprises probably close to 80% of the literature. Um, and it's been used for finding um, and, and evaluating drug leads and other useful other and mechanisms of actions and other other signaling events. So <clears throat> One of the questions that you have of, of, of it is though, is that um, so I've shown you it's time dependent. And we read, you read the information out by looking at peptides. And the exchange rate of each amide is a function of the variables that affect the Gibbs energy of exchange. And those are the pH of the solution, the temperature of the solution, the ionic strength of the solution matters, and pressure. And so if you're doing a measurement, with so many variables um, to keep track of, just how reliable is a hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry measurement? We looked at this, and this actually is part of this talk here. And the first lo way we looked at it is we had a student run 20 experiments a day with 30 second immersions. Now this is ubiquitin, pepsin, um, and it has about 76, 78 amino acids on it, which the sequence is shown there, probably too small for you to see, but the numbers are shown on the left. And when you slice it up with, with, with a pepsin protease, the, the, these bands here are shown in black uh, just represent the, the peptides that you would see. And these peptides are also seen on the, on the graph at the bottom with their amount of deuterium that they're that they're taking now each spot is not one measurement it's actually um, 20 measurements for one day 20 measurements for day two and then 20 measurements on day 37 so each dot is actually actually 60 measurements and as you can see um, there's not a lot of variability because they lay on top of each other 
we can take this and look at the, just the standard deviations only and look at them for day one and the average standard deviation of the spots. The, each spot represents all the pep, all one peptide and all the measurements done, the 20 measurements done that particular day. And you can see that the average there is about 1% standard deviation and the maximum is about 1.8 on day one. Day two, it's a bit more, but it's still about 1%. And day 37 is about the same. So you would say that the repeatability is is about 1%. Actually, at worst, it's, it's 2%. And the intermediate measurement precision is still about 1% to 2%. This gets into what the... Um, the components of precision are, and they are repeatability, which is what you get out of your lab when you do the measurement with the same operator, same operating conditions over and over again with the same equipment. Your intermediate measurement precision is the standard inside the laboratory. And so if you keep track of these in your own work, you can do good work with epitope studies, single lab in a single lab. But if you're representing something on the outside, you need to know what the measurement reproducibility is. That is, if I take a sack of, sack of sugar and measure it in, in, in Salt Lake, and I take it down to Houston, Texas, what will be the difference in the weight? That's what reproducibility is. So the only way you can return, determine the reproducibility of any method is that you have to send it out to a lot of different laboratories. And what's the value of that? Well, the value of that is that when you establish what that reproducibility is, this allows you to understand if you're doing multiple experiments in multiple labs of, of how, of what, the, of the, what level of correspondence you can expect among the labs. So if you were a drug company and you had three three different labs doing the same work on something and you wanted to compare data, then you could compare the data. Um, and the other part of it is if you're gonna release this material to commerce um, for any use in commerce, uh, you need to know this reproducibility. Okay, to, to conduct, conduct this uh, uh, reproducibility study, we prepared a uh, Christmas sampler a type of box that contained some standardized solutions. Um, this was shipped cold to the fif to 15 laboratories, and the the contents of the solution were uh, a proteomics um, proteomics uh, um, solutions, and then uh, three so the solutions necessary to do three runs of hydrogen nuclear exchange. The, um, the, the main sample, the protein sample, was a fab of NISMAB, which is a standard um, antibody that NIST issues, issues and is uh, widely available. Um, it's enzymatically clipped from the F FC portion, and so it, make, it simplifies the, uh, the, uh, the proteomics and the, uh, num the amount of data that people got, but it still produces a tremendous amount of data. So the, um, the the solutions organize the experiments. They provide all the glassware and buffers required for sample preparations. Most importantly, it conserves the pH and PD and the, and the D2O fraction. And one thing that we found that was very important was providing the uh, TSEP, which reduces the di disulfide bonds. And we found that there's some variation of quality out there and we wanted everybody to have the same quality so we shipped that to them also um the whole point of this is that going back to the experiment we we have an environment that's defined by the kit during the important labeling and quenching steps the rest of the experiment is controlled by the laboratory um, and the conditions of their equipment but the most important part, which is the labeling, is controlled by a standardized environment that we provide by the kit. So the 15 labs uh, reported their centroids for their for their three runs, 
And that totaled up to 89,800 centroid measurements. Um, as you can see here in, in the explosion, exploded view below, um, they comprise uh, a list of the of the um, the peptide the uh, the peptide identification where it sits in the protein. Um, this is the fab of NISMAB again, protein. It's retention time, and then it's it's um, it's weight, it's centroid weight, at each of um, each each of of of, of the uh, several time frames that we gave it. Um, looking at the whole spreadsheet, it really does look like this, only only bigger because there's 15 of these. So. If you take all of that, you can end up with a repeatability plot for all the peptides. So what this represents is, this is the deviation of, for example, time zero for each group, and then time one, which is about 30 seconds for each group, time 60 seconds out to four hours. And then we also have a control, which we call T, T, and, T equals infinity. So, but this is the self-consistency of each measurement. The standard deviation of the measurement is what's represented there. And each one of these points on there is the standard deviation of all the peptides for that particular group. So that represents about, about a thousand measurements per point on this graph. The important thing is, is that 87% of the graph of the labs get about uh, 0.15 Dalton's uh, of precision, all the labs get better than 0.4. This may sound terrible from a mass accuracy point of view, but remember the average peptide that they're measuring is about 1,000, M over Z of 1,000. So the precision is actually pretty, pretty, pretty good. And these are centroids, not mass accuracy in the normal sense of what a mass spectrometer is, measures. Okay, now if we we want to measure the reproducibility of the these measurements. This is the diff. This would be the difference between the time zero and the time thirty second, and time zero and time sixty second, time and each time out to four hours. And then you plot each each laboratory's measurements on a graph. And six of these are shown on the left panel here. And those are the plots of the back exchange corrected. The uptake versus time for each of the of the six peptide sequences that we that I'm showing here, and this is shown for nine groups. These are the nine groups that worked at 25 degrees C. There were other groups that measured at 21 degrees and at 3.6 degrees. I'll show you, show you that in a second. So the 25 degree lab cohort taken together, they get a they get a reproducibility a standard deviation of about six and a half percent. And that's for 14 peptide sequences. I'm showing left six of them on the left here. It's boring if you look at too many of them. And the, one of the interesting things here is that the standard deviations really don't deviate with time, which is nice, nice feature. Uh, one didn't quite expect that, I expected a little bit of deviation. The other thing is you take all the other times and temperatures, excuse me, uh, and that this takes you to your 15 groups. The weighted mean of all their standard deviations indicates that the lab, the reproducibility is about 9%. Now, this is a weighted mean derived for 244 peptide sequences. And so the standard deviations, again, don't deviate much with time. Now you see those little points up there, which are 3.6 degrees. They don't really represent a lot of weight. The, uh, the weighted average really and is about 9% or better for all of this. So what does this really mean? This means that if a naive customer, that is, and we don't say naive in the terms of stupid, we mean naive in the terms of they don't really know the, the art of how to do hydrogen deuterium exchange. And so they just go to a service lab and say, measure me, measure me a bunch of peptides for me and tell me what the reproducibility, what or what what you measure. And then how much how much how much variance would I expect to see if I took it to another laboratory? 
it had been measured, say, 100 or 200 peptides off of this of this protein sample. What would I? What would the variance be? And that would be nine, about nine percent. And of course, that's the distribution. So some would be more, and some would be less. The repeatability is what you do when you're doing an apoholo experiment. And what this tells you by their repeatability seen across the labs is if you consider a three sigma uh, difference as being different enough, that would mean that 0.45 Daltons is, is always significant for, for measurements when you're looking at, at protein interactions of APO, uh, protein interactions like an APO-HOLO uh, sample experiment. This paper actually took a lot of people and a lot of work, and it will be coming out in the next couple months. And uh, so it, this is the list of people. It's, there's 37 people on, on this paper. Now, <clears throat> let's go to membrane proteins. Uh, we, we've, we've done what I think is a pretty good contribution to this field. And it's important because 60% of all drug targets are membrane proteins. The problem with membrane proteins is that you need to put them into, if you're going to study them in vitro, you need to put them on a bicell liposome or a nanodisc. And then you can study them in pretty much their native behavior. But the problem with this is that as soon as you go and you try and do an analysis with say a C12 column, it destroys that thousand dollar column very quickly. And the other part of it is, is that the, the lipids themselves in the electrospray, they suppress ions, so you're not going to get very good signals. Now, investigators know how to deal with this. They add zirconium oxide and do a, a manual mechanic, a manual um, procedure which removes the, pep, the, um, the lipids. <clears throat> but they have to stand for hours in front of an instrument and do this and do and do these manipulations by hand. They this takes extra time, and so they're, the data they're getting is, they even by their own admission say that they wish they were getting better data because it just takes a little bit too long to do this work. So the, and the other part of it is, is that if you're, a, if you're a commercial laboratory, you're not probably going to be doing this technique because it just takes too much labor and people quite frankly don't have the, have the um, patience to do, to do this type of work. So what we did is we took a, um, the uh, FCD32 um, FC uh, receptor, um, which is a, a, a membrane protein, it's a single pass membrane protein, and, and it's and it directly expressed into liposomes and um, collected as exosomes. And we did some experiments to see if we could do the separation properly. What I have pictured here is is its an interaction with the FC I see off of the off of the map, but in fact, this is just a picture of the the uh, blue part there, and you can see the, the membrane bilayer that it's involved with. And you need to remove these phospholipids for the chromatographic um, chromatographic separation. So now, on the left here, just to show, is what a standard uh, experiment without the without the um, need to remove the lipids is, and it's fairly straightforward. Next to it is the, the differences. And with the mechanized method that we have, automated method we have, it adds 70 seconds to the process. And most of that is done at lower temperature. So what this looks like is that you do your regular hydrogen deuterium exchange experiment. You then take the solution, put it into put it into a solution with zirconium oxide and, and denaturants just as you would normally. Then you put, you take that, and that, that cell that you put it into originally is the bottom of a crush filter cell. And then you, you, you put the top on it, you crush it, and the supernatant pops to the, comes to the filter, and you inject that into your LCMS, and your lipids are removed. This looks like for a, a robotic system such as ours, this and it also is generally available out in the field. Um, <clears throat> this looks pretty simple to do. You you just stock up your drawers, as shown here on the lower right, 
with your filter inserts, your exchange that you would have in a normal experiment. The filter base is, is there, which is where your quench is. And then you, you just load it across onto the filter base, put it into the express, and then, and then, um, and then just uh, take the supernatant and inject it. Um, what you get out of this, if you do this with the CD2, CD32A um, receptor that we did, and this is the this is the map, the peptide map. A peptide map in HDX tells you what you can see if you do a hydrogen determinant exchange experiment because these are the peptides that you would see. And as you can see here, the entire map show, is in mostly in red, but it's about 80%, 85% coverage. You can even see some of the transmembrane region here, which is shown as this black bar here in the sequence. And this is all available for hydrogen during exchange experiments. It, an important point is that the addition of the zirconium oxide does not diminish the protein ion signal. So therefore, putting the zirconium oxide in is not going to change your, is not going to spoil your experiment at all. And this method has been published in the uh, in analytical chemistry back in June, I believe. So the summary of this work is that automated hydrogen to term exchange of membrane proteins is now possible. And this will allow you to do a lot more complex experiments and improves your precision when you're doing membrane protein dynamics. Compared to manual analysis of membrane proteins, automated hydrogen deuterium exchange reduces the analysis time by one or two minutes per sample. And this results in much less back exchange of the, in the data. And the automated hydrogen deuterium exchange of um, membrane proteins makes extensive studies of large molecule and small molecule um, drug um, membrane protein interactions feasible. So we have a lot of hope that this this will disseminate out and be used by drug developers uh, for their experiments. Now, I keep dropping the term back exchange during this during this uh, presentation. And as the title in, indicates, it's the scourge of this method. And what batch exchange is, is that as soon as you start the analysis, you're doing it, you go from a D2O solution to a water solution. And so you're bet, you, you are losing your deuterium label. This corrupts the protein. And in effect, it's like, like overdeveloping a photograph and you start losing, uh, losing uh, features. And this, this, um, this mean, and this effect is um, is about 15 to 45 percent in the in the NISMAP study that I just showed you for the reproducibility. The typical peptide that we saw had somewhere between 15 and 45 percent back exchange. So you're losing a lot of information that you that you might want to keep. It can be made worse on particular side chains, such as histidine and others. Uh, because they even connect catalyze catalysis for this exchange. And also the other problem is, is that overlapping loops should be during the fast LC separations suppress ions. You do this, these fast separations because you need to do them fast because um, you're losing your label. And as a result, you do them fast. But when you do it that way, you get more overlap and you see fewer peptide sequences because, and if you were using longer gradients, you would get a number of, pep, a lot more identifications of peptides and you get a lot more information. But as I say, you're, you're, you're in a race against time and you're going to lose if you, do, if you use long ones. So we know that if we were to decrease the temperature, say to minus 30, we could reduce the back exchanges by a factor of 40. Well, of course, water freezes at zero, that's a problem. So here's the computed and measured for a back exchange at zero degrees. And uh, the current recovery practice is about 80% recovery average across. And you, for a 10 minute illusion, you're talking about you know 82% recovery. So 80, 82. If you were to take that to minus 20, and this has been done by mixing ethylene glycol in, um, 
you can get in the 10 minute, 10 minute illusion, you can get 92, 95% recovery. And over here, if you were in 90, in minus 30, you could actually get 95% recovery with a 40 minute illusion rate on your, chromatic, on your chromatograph. So you could separate all, a lot more peptides and still keep your hydrogen to term exchange combination. And so how do you do this? Well, I designed an instrument that runs at minus 30. And it comprises a stack of six, six, um, um, six pumps. It has in the usual ESI source, it has a nine zone temperature controller, your valve controller, the usual things that you use. And breaking it out, this mounts on a ray on the robot rail. And you have your injector point, of course, that the robot does. But instead of one protease column, I have two. And this allows you to do much more complex digest. If you have a, gly a glycan that you need to remove to get good digestion, you can put a glycosidase column in on the top chamber and put a prote proteolytic column in the bottom. Um, all the, uh, the chamber is at zero for fluidic uh, things, including a reducing cell if you need it. And then everything goes onto the guard column and and um, and then the um, the separations are conducted at minus 30. So these three chambers run at different temperatures. Your main preparation is at zero or about one degree. Your proteolytic can be from zero to 10. And then your actual analytical, <clears throat> analytical uh, steps are done at minus 30. Um, what that allows you You can keep your total back exchange to about 5%. It gives you cleaner chromatography, gives you a lot better accuracy on deuterium measurements. And it also, what's built into this design is a lot better cleaning of the protease columns. So you get a lot fewer artifacts from, from ghost signals and other things. Um, there is a price and the price is you have to have a pump that can pump 1500 bar but those are commercially available today too. So this is the laboratory. Uh, this is not all my work. I have other people that have helped me. You saw a long list of authors um, on, the, on the main, on the, on the first part of this talk, but the people who work with me at NIST who make this all possible are Yanni Karajogis, Kyle Anderson, Alicia Gallagher, who uh, is now an assistant professor at Baylor Jim Philbin helped with the statistical work and Travis Gallagher helped with the structural work with the crystallography section. And thank you for listening to my webinar. Thank you, Dr. Hudgens, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. Okay, so let's get started. Our first question is, when two proteins undergo a binding interaction, do they always exhibit decreased deuterium uptake? Um, that's the answer to that question. Is A quick answer is no. Um, at the point of the interaction between the two proteins where they're actually binding, you'll usually see, almost always see, a reduction as shown in the examples I presented. But where you, where, where that you can get allosteric interactions, events where other parts of the protein will loosen up. The biggest, the per perfect example of this is, is that hemoglobin or myoglobin, which binds with iron. When the iron binds, you'll see a reduction of, de of deuterium exchange around the binding side of the iron. But on the outside, the protein actually loosens up, and this causes additional deuterium exchange on the outside. And this, this is actually important for drug discovery because you can use, you can, uh, there's other examples where you can actually see allosteric interactions of a, of a drug lead with the target that you're actually going for. Thank you for that. Looks like we have time for just one more question. So it is, is the lipid removal system limited to HDX-MS experiments? 
Well, lipid removal is, is commonly needed for a lot of things where you would want to do chromatography. And so if your, tech, if your method needs, a, needs part of the workflow to be removal of a lipid, this, this will work fine. You can do it automated and you can buy manual crushers, which will still work faster than the spin down method that, that is currently, that was used in the literature before we introduced this. Uh, and you can buy those, and those still are faster than to use than than using a a, a spin down method for separation. Thank you for that. I would like to once again thank Dr. Hudgens for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January 25th, 2019. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye.